everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today for our webinar, Six Keys to Maintaining the Engagement of a Remote Workforce. Our presenter today is Bob Lavinia, who is the Director of the Institute for Public Sector Employee Engagement here at CPSHR Consulting. Today's session is being recorded, and we will post a slide deck and link to the session on the webinars page of our website as soon as they are available. Please check for these resources at www.cpshr.us slash about slash events slash webinars. To ensure a high quality recording, all attendees are in listen only mode. Please be sure to keep your line muted to avoid interruptions to the presentation. If you have any questions for the presenter, please enter them in the webinar Q&A panel on the right side of your screen. We'll address the questions at the end of the presentation as time allows. And now, let's get started. Bob? Thanks very much, Julie. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, depending upon where you are. I want to welcome all of you. Have a great turnout for this webinar from across the country and even abroad. So even before COVID-19, many employees were working remotely, at least part of the time. Now, of course, millions more, including in government, are working from home full time. This has created challenges not only with technology, but also around employees' well-being, performance, and productivity. And for example, a recent survey found that 58% of employees who responded characterized their current emotional state at work as fearful, anxious, and or stressed. And according to an executive and an organization, the transition to a completely remote workforce before the virus struck, this transition to working remotely is, quote, a process, not a binary switch to be flipped, unquote. And while many may view the surge in remote working as a short-term response to a national emergency, I really think it's much more than that. When this crisis subsides, and we hope that'll be sooner rather than later, some employers are gladly gonna return to their offices, their work site, and their colleagues. But I think many will wanna continue working from home at least part-time. And one HR director from a large city said last week that we need to prepare for this as a long-term change, not just a short-term transition. One challenge in managing a re remote workforce is how to keep employees engaged when they're not physically at their work sites. And this is critical not just because more employees are working from home, but also because, as we'll talk a little bit about this, the level of engagement across the U.S. workforce is already low, including in government. So I want to cover two things in the time we have together, give you a little bit of background on employee engagement, then discuss some suggestions based on research about how to meet the challenge of keeping remote workers engaged. And I'd like to say that uh, I'm going to share some secrets or, or magic about employee engagement, but unfortunately, I, no, I don't have the secret sauce. It really is about doing what we need to do to make sure that employees who are now suddenly working remotely still feel connected to the organization. And I first started working remotely way back in 2006. I also supervised remote employees. So I know that it can be a great arrangement, but it also has its challenges, especially in situations like we face today, where, as I mentioned, folks had to begin working remotely literally overnight. A little bit about our organization. We're an independent, self-supporting government agency, as you can see. Our focus is on promoting excellence in government, provide a full range of HR solutions, but HR as a way to improve organizational performance, not HR for its own sake. 1,200 clients uh, across the country, largely uh, state and local government agencies. And several years ago, we created a new organizational unit, the Institute for Public Sector Employee Engagement, to focus more specifically on helping government organizations measure and improve employee engagement. So at the Institute, we are all engagement all the time. So what is this thing called employee engagement? It's really about creating opportunity for employees to have a strong connection between the work they do and the mission of the organization. Engaged employees are proud of what they do, they feel the organization values them. In return, they're willing to deliver what's known in the research as discretionary effort, which really just means they're willing to do whatever it takes to help the organization succeed and achieve its mission. And someone once remarked to me that when they think of employee engagement, 
they think of it as the opposite of employee burnout. So that's another way to, to think of it. Why does it matter? Well, in the, pub, in the public sector and in the private sector, there have been decades of research linking improved engagement to improved organizational performance. And, and here's just a list of the positive outcomes that research had shown high levels of employee engagement drives. And, and I'll give you one example. Our research, we do an annual national poll at the Institute to assess the level of engagement in, in, across the entire U.S. economy. And our research has shown that in government, highly engaged employees are three times more likely to believe their organization is achieving its mission and also three times more likely to feel that they individually can influence quality, cost, and customer service. And we sort of roll up all of this research, especially in government, into this engagement value chain. So improved engagement drives improved performance. That leads to higher satisfaction among the citizens and residents that we serve. That leads to more trust in government, that we need more trust in government. And if the, the people that public servants serve believe and trust government, public servants are also more likely to feel engaged. So that's why we, re we refer to this as a virtuous cycle. So how engaged is the U.S. workforce? As I mentioned, we do an annual national poll, survey around 2,000 employees in the public and private sectors in a variety of occupations to understand what the level of engagement is. And here are the results from our most recent survey. And what you see here are the levels of engagement, fully, somewhat, and not engaged, private sector, government overall, federal, state, and local combined, and then federal, state, and local government separately. So what you can clearly see is government employees are less engaged than private sector employees, and also the level of not engaged is higher in government than it is in the private sector. So we had a lot of work to do even before COVID-19 appeared. So how do we maintain the engagement of remote workers? We really need to understand what influences or drives employee engagement. And these drivers can vary across organizations and can even vary within organizations. That's why it's important to collect feedback from employees to understand how they're feeling about this new work arrangement and then focus on what's important. And we'll talk about the need to collect feedback a little bit later. However, the results from our annual national survey, which I just described, not just on the levels of engagement, but what the specific influences on engagement, the drivers are in government, can help guide some steps to keep remote employees engaged. So based on this survey and other research, I'm gonna talk about six plus steps to maintain employee engagement. I say six plus, because the theme of this CPS web, web series is six, but I had seven, so I had to cheat a little. So it's about leadership. It's about training and development. Leadership includes communication. Focusing on the mission and the work, appreciation and recognition, expectations and tools, and asking for feedback. So let's go through them one at a time. Number one, providing strong and visible leadership. Our Institute survey has consistently shown that leadership is the number one key driver of employee engagement. And we've also worked with many organizations across the nation, and we almost always see that leadership is a key driver. Leaders influence engagement by being visible, by communicating effectively, by exemplifying the values of the organization, and managing change well. And when most employees are working from home, it's important for leaders to be visible, even if they can't do that in person. Employees need to see their leaders are continuing to actively manage the organization. They aren't hunkered down in a bunker somewhere, even if that bunker is their den. And employees also need to feel that leaders care about them, have empathy for their situations, that working remotely can be a big and stressful change, especially for those who also have to take care of children who are young and or are home from school. It's a big and unexpected change management challenge set of challenges. Some employees will feel that they lost something of value overnight, their work environment, their socialization through work, their colleagues, and leaders need to understand and appreciate this loss. Not everybody's happy about it and manage this change with empathy. I quoted uh, or cited a quote earlier about the transition to a remote workforce, that it's a process 
not a binary switch to be flipped. And this is truly a case where it's impossible to over-communicate. And you really can't discuss leadership without discussing communication. That's where we're going to segue into the next factor, which is communication. And in fact, as we go through all of the suggestions, I think you'll see that leadership underlies many of them. So 1A, communication, communication, communication. According to a recent report on the state of remote work, and I'm going to hesitate for a second uh, and try to get a message that some folks can't hear me. So let me see, Julie, what can we do about that? Hi, I understand some people may be having some difficulties yeah. hearing the the um, presentation. If you're using your computer for audio, you may want to try dialing in. Um, the, the recording of this session will include full audio. Um, so hopefully dialing in by phone will help. Okay. Okay, so just continue. Please do. Okay, great. So communication, as I mentioned, according to a recent report on the state of remote, remote work, communication and collaboration are among the biggest challenges of working remotely. And that was before the coronavirus. So anyone in a leadership position needs to try to reach employees through multiple means, and not just email or messaging. This is truly an all of the above situation. Telephone, websites, blogs, internet, Twitter, Facebook, communication platforms like Zoom and Teams, not just audio, but especially video. One local government leader records a weekly video and shares it with all employees to create a visible and regular presence. And if you can't do video, another leader sends weekly updates through email and Teams. And it's important that communication isn't haphazard or ad hoc. It's important to develop a communication strategy or plan that specifies the objective of the message, the audience it's targeted at, especially the method in the media, who will deliver the message and when. And communication should also include developing and widely sharing remote work policies. You can also develop and post FAQs addressing key issues. CDC has posted FAQs about the virus that you can use, but supplement with, with questions about your, that your own employees are asking. And it's okay to be optimistic, but we also need to be candid, to build trust. Be transparent about issues like the budget, and the layoff. For supervisors, emailing, chatting, and messaging may be convenient, but you can't always substitute these for face-to-face -face interactions, particularly for sensitive or nuanced topics. And here uh, is a set of FAQs, um, not necessarily FAQs that will apply to your organization, but just an example of the kinds of questions that government organizations have identified and are sharing uh, the responses. Of course, the questions and answers depend on specific situations and policies, but it's helpful for employees trying to navigate this difficult environment. And here is a communication plan template. So the communication strategic, comprehensive, and targeted. Number two, don't neglect training and development. And in this environment, it might be easy to, to ignore employee development, since many of us are, are just scrambling to get our work done. But really, this would be a mistake. Managers, supervisors, and employees should continue to discuss and focus on development using alternatives and options that don't require in-person interaction. Sending a message to employees that development is still important. We're trying to continue business as usual as much as we can. For example, taking advantage of the explosion in online training, which has been accelerated due to an expansion in remote work. Many organizations, including our own, have expanded online training. And while most in-person conferences have been postponed or canceled, some are substituting online virtual web-based events. And individual organizations can also transition to delivering their internal training virtually. Another proven strategy is mentoring which doesn't require face-to-face -face contact, but still gonna be highly effective and it is cost efficient. So the bottom line is 
responsibility of everyone, managers, supervisors, and employees, to keep our focus on employee development. Number three, focus on the mission and the work. Stream of research known as public service motivation has revealed that government employees have a high level of commitment, organization, mission, and purpose. Many public servants were attracted to government by the missions of their agencies. And that's why it's more important than ever for our employees to understand and feel connected to the organization's mission, to see clearly how their work supports that mission, feel they are making a difference, and believe their organization is, ach is achieving its mission. Our research has found that, as I mentioned earlier, highly engaged employees are three times more likely to believe their organizations are achieving their mission. And for many public servants, the mission is more important than ever because government is the lifeline some of the people we serve, human services, child protective services, for example, and of course, healthcare, we hear a lot about. Senior leaders, managers, supervisors need to take extra steps to define, communicate, and emphasize the mission and express gratitude for employees' continued commission to the mission. This can include creating opportunities for employees to interact with customers and stakeholders, even when they can't do this in person. And I'll go back to what I mentioned earlier, for example, human services and child protective services often deal with clients who are among the neediest in our communities. They may not be able to interact by computer, but as someone who works in human services told me this week, her clients all have phones. So here's an example of a COVID-19 guidance from a child protective service agency on alternative ways for their employees to connect with clients and maintain relationships, even when they can't do that in person. Here's another example from the Wisconsin Department of Children's and, and Families has provided for its staff. The department does much of its work through local nonprofits who interact with clients in their counties. And this is an excerpt, what you see here, from a county by county list that the department has developed for agency employees. Agency works with a network of local nonprofits and compiled this list showing the virtual tools that each local organization is using to connect with their clients, systematic and comprehensive. So number four, recognize and appreciate. Again, our institute's research, the National Survey on Employee Engagement has consistently found that a key cultural driver in government is assuring that employees feel valued. As we know, this can be tough without physical proximity. It's no longer possible to walk down the hallway to thank or praise an employee. That notwithstanding, it's important to reach out to remote employees to recognize their contributions and accomplishments. And as we said earlier, emphasize that we're grateful for their continued commitment during difficult circumstances. And for example, I was recently on a, on a teleconference where a manager praised the work of one of the folks on the call and I could almost hear the smile in her voice when she said thanks. You know, sometimes a small compliment like this can go a long way. Agencies should create, publicize, and use online tools for recognition, including allowing employees to nominate each other. And it's not just about online tools. Offline approaches, such as thank you cards, handwritten notes, and even birthday and anniversary cards. It doesn't always mean money. Here is one organization's list of ways to recognize employees without spending a dime. This is from the organization's supervisor's handbook. And of course, this predate, predates COVID-19, but it's relevant, I think, still to today's remote working environment. Might have to modify the approaches, may not be a bulletin board in the office, but it could be an electronic bulletin board, posting messages on Teams. It's important to reach out and make sure employees know we appreciate their commitment and contribution, regardless of where they're working. Number five, set expectations and provide tools. Leaders need to set expectations and accountabilities. It's no longer possible to know if employees are, work are working merely by seeing them at their desks or their work site. And I know this is often difficult for supervisors who are uncomfortable without seeing their employees at work. But I think the answer is to manage goals and results not just attendance and activities. That's a, that's a good idea when things get back to normal. Organizations are providing training tools and tips about how to supervise and lead a remote workforce. 
one state government developed an online training program for supervisors. And the web has tons of information about how to manage remote workforces. According to one government executive, we've had to drastically change, putting aside the usual focus just to count workers' hours and days. People who have kids, according to her, people who have kids need to take an hour off to put someone down for a nap or make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And I think, you know, longer term, this is really an opportunity to take a look at how we work try to focus on results, not just activities. We also need to provide materials and equipment. Remote workers need tools to, to work remotely. One city HR director said employees without laptops are bringing their desktop computers home, which is a heavy lift, literally. But they need, they need to have the tools. Another organization, city is buying 250 laptops for employees who are working remotely. One state is spending millions to equip employees with technology tools. Local government employee told me that her Wi-Fi was too spotty to allow her to work effectively at home. And my response was, come on, get her a mobile hotspot or a better data plan. So tools include platforms for communicating with the remote workforce workers. It seems like the, the whole country is using Zoom, although it has some issues. At CPS, we use Teams to communicate with our remote employees, and we have folks all over the country. Some employee organizations are actually providing childcare for workers who need to, um, to report for work, including for first responders. And they're also beefing up wellness information on their websites to help employees take care of themselves. And we know that the right tools can reduce the stress of this change. And then last but certainly not least, ask for feedback. Earlier, we talked about how important it is for leaders to communicate effectively, but we know that communication is two-way, more important than ever to stay connected to our employees. And one way to do that is to survey them. Research has shown that employees really wanna provide feedback during times like this. There was a recent poll that found 86% of participants believe it is appropriate or completely appropriate for their employer to survey them in the current environment. Now, feedback can be collected through a comprehensive employee engagement survey that will reveal the level of engagement and what influences engagement. That's a big part of what we do at the Institute. And organizations that are unsure whether to conduct these surveys maybe should consider moving forward. This can send the message that the organization is doing everything it can to understand how the new work environment is affecting employees and they want to continue business as, as usual. An alternative is a shorter survey focuses focusing specifically on the new remote working arrangement. Questions can address things like how employees feel about their leaders, their supervisors, their communication, tools, resources, and even their own well-being. Employees want to be heard, and it's the employer's job to give them that opportunity. So our six plus keys to maintaining engagement, I'm not going to read them because, because you can read them. You have to understand what influences or drives engagement. These drivers can vary across organizations, can even vary within organizations. But our research, our national survey, has revealed nationally what the key drivers of engagement are and, and help with the focus on these factors, um, particularly with our millions of employees who are now working remotely. But I also want to say that organizations shouldn't focus just on employees wor working remotely. Many public servants can't work at home, and they are risking their own health to serve their communities. We can't forget about them, and much of what we described today applies to these employees as well. So to, to finish up, it's a cliche that the flip side of challenge is opportunity. <clears throat> Excuse me. But if we view today's working conditions as a unique opportunity to show public sector employees that we care about them, we can boost engagement. And that'll be a win for government organizations, public servants, and most important, the people that government serves. So I hope most of you were able to hear me. I, I know we had some problems. I'm going to turn it back to Julie now and handle some questions. Okay, thanks, Bob. We do have some questions that have come in. Uh, so here's first one. Someone is asking, 
how you can manage blocks of personal time so remote work, like emails, calls, Zoom meetings, don't take up your whole day. Yeah, you know, I've, as I said, I've worked remotely for a long time, and it is, it is hard to ignore that kind of communication, but it, it is um, literally possible to, to turn your email off for a while and, uh, <clears throat> and focus on on big blocks of time where you have to do specific assignments. So, you know, I, I really encourage people to, uh, uh, to not constantly look at their email, but turn it off, uh, shut it down for a little while, maybe a half hour, an hour, do some concentrated work, and then get back to email. I think people will understand if you're, if you're not responding to, uh, to a message, to an IM or an email immediately. But it's important that we have some time away from uh, that kind of communication to really focus on work that, that requires that kind of uh, intensive focus. Okay, that's a great idea. Thank you. The next question is from someone asking, uh, how do you ensure that employees working remotely remain actively engaged in assigned tasks, producing both a high quality and quantity of work? Well, you know, that's, it's an interesting question because my rejoinder to that is, how do you know that when people are at the, at the work site? You know, that's why I mentioned we need to focus more on managing results and outcomes and less on managing work activity and whether folks are at their, at their desks or at their work sites. And also, as I mentioned, I think this is really an opportunity for us to take a look at how we do work and how we manage work. How we can focus on, on results and deliverables and outcomes, and not just whether people uh, are putting in their time. So take a look at how we, how we manage and measure performance. What indicators, what outcomes do we have to know that people are, are doing their work, they're doing it on time, they're doing it at a, a high quality level, uh, and they're and they're delivering the kinds of, of outcomes and results that that we need. So I know this is a tough transition for some supervisors, but we, as I mentioned, we really need to take a look at the work that we do and how we manage and measure outcomes. Okay. Um, so another question then. Uh, came in asking, so what do you do when you think employees aren't working because they aren't getting through their to-do list and producing results or even asking questions? Well, again, how do you do that when, when people are in, in the workplace? Um, if someone isn't performing, we have performance management um, uh, uh, processes and, and systems. We need to be able to sit down with our employees, even if we can't do that literally face-to-face -face in person, but we can use uh, we can use our technology to have conversations to make sure that we're setting expectations, that there's agreement on the expectations, there's agreement on, on the work, the results, and the outcomes, and that the employee is producing those results, deliverables, and outcomes. So I don't think it's much different than how we would interact with our employees on a day-to-day -day basis, make sure that we are setting clear expectations and their employees are producing, and if they're not, how we can turn that around and make sure that we're putting employees in the best possible position to succeed. So even though we're physically separate from employees, I think we still need to manage and supervise them in terms of expectations and performance in the same way that we do when we are with them in person. Okay. Um, so then we are running a little bit long, but let's take one more question. And, and this one came in asking, what does engaged, engage, engaged engagement mean in the context of workforce engagement? What would that look like? So, in other words, how do we know if an employee is engaged? What kind of behaviors do engaged employees uh, exhibit? Okay, so engaged employees are focused on customer service. They deliver and are committed to their customers. They volunteer ideas, they're proactive, not reactive. They're interested in helping the organization succeed and, and they have ideas about how to do that. Uh, they work not just hard, but they work smart. They stay with the organization. A lot of research showing that high engagement organizations have better retention 
uh, lower turnover, okay. they show up. Highly engaged organizations have better uh, attendance than low engaged organizations. And they say good things about the organization. They feel good about where they're working. They feel good about their job and the mission of the organization. And they're saying good things about where they work in their communities, in their networks. So those are some of the behaviors <clears throat> that engaged employees exhibit. Okay, terrific. Well, I want to thank you, Bob, for sharing your insight on this. This has been so very helpful, and I'm sure our audience appreciated it. Um, so thank you to everyone who joined us today as well. And please be sure to check our website within one to two days at www.cpshr.us slash about slash events slash webinars for the slide deck and the recording. Thank you so much and have a great day. Bye.